I'm going to introduce you to one of our, well, and, and we've just heard from one of our longest serving stars in Bob McNair. I'm now going to turn to what we're calling Act Three, and I'm going to turn to Dr. Eva Brand. Now, I was going to introduce Eva as RJJ Watt, Bob, but for this season, I'm not. Because while she seriously cannot compare to him in physical stature, I think in the importance of her play to our organization has been similar. So it is now my privilege to introduce Dr. Eva Brand. She is a senior contributor to the Imaginative Conservative. Since 1957, she has been a tutor at St. John's College in Annapolis. St. John's is renowned for its Great Books program. And earlier I mentioned that Wyoming Catholic College is our youngest college partner. Well, St. John's, founded in 1696, is our oldest college partner. Eva has honored the tradition of the American Republic and her founders through her work with her students at St. John's in writing hundreds of essays and nearly dozens of books now on the great intellectual tradition of the West. She has explored the thinking of those greatest minds across millennia who have sought the true, the good, and the beautiful. Now, this ties in very well with our theme this morning because the books that she has been teaching and writing about for so long, uh, Shakespeare, Plutarch, um, the Bible, uh, Cicero, are the books that formed the founders of our country. When you look at their letters and lectures and talks, they reference the books that Eva has been focusing on for the past 59 years at St. John's College. President George Bush honored Eva in 2005 with a Lifetime Achievement Award by giving her the National Humanities Medal. And we are very pleased that the, one of the first essays she wrote for us entitled Reflections on Conservatism, is now part of her book, Then and Now, which came out last year and we have out in the uh, book area. It's, uh, I think it's also worthwhile thinking about for just a second. We've published almost 100 essays now by Eva Brown on our site. Those include titles such as The Translucent Poetry of the Declaration of Independence, the Brilliance of James Madison's Remonstrance and Memorial, The Sublime Jane Austen, and What is Time? The essays and the teaching and the speaking of Eva Brand, which she continues to be teaching, writing, and speaking almost full time uh, now, um, are, it's always penetrating, and frankly, it's always challenging. But I'm glad that we can now say that Eva Brand and her work has had an important shaping on our work. And let me tell you one last thing about Eva Brand. You see, Eva just barely escaped the clutches of Adolf Hitler and his Nazi regime. Because in 1939, as a child, she boarded the last train allowed out of Germany carrying Jews. Clearly, she understands what happens to freedom when freedom is lost and when books are burned. Eva's flight from tyranny led her to the land of freedom, America, or the land of Brooklyn, maybe America, you want to say, because that's where she landed. She eventually found her way to Annapolis, to St. John's, where she dedicated her life to preserving the light and learning contained in those very same books that the Nazis were burning when she and her family were driven out of her country. She has preserved the flame of freedom for future generations. And we are blessed to have her as a beloved member of our community. And it's just amazing that now her story is part of our story. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask Dr. Brand to now come up. Steve. JJ might have to be helped up now, I don't know, but, but Eva is. We're gonna make sure that's turned on. Eva asked if uh, we could 
Do this? Like? Oh, <laughs> and she asked me to give her a speech, too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Winston. Uh, I want you to know that St. John's College in Annapolis was the college from which the author of the uh, Star Spangled Banner graduated. Uh, Francis Scott Key is an alumnus of St. John's College. Uh, I also, I've been a teacher all my life. And what teachers do is correct things. So I have a correction to make. This little talk was announced on your programs as the timeliness of the tradition. That was not my title. My, t my title was the timelessness of the tradition. Actually, it might have been an improvement. <laughs> so on the timelessness of the tradition. It is both an honor and a pleasure to be among you. I don't know if I can show my appreciation by my talk. I can't quite believe that normal people want to hear composed speeches for breakfast. <laughs> Most of us want to read our newspapers and drink our morning coffee in peace and quiet and don't want to be talked to even by our nearest and dearest. <laughs> and now you have to listen to an alien from the northerly East Coast. <laughs> well, the ancient rhetoricians who knew their business taught that the way to begin a speech, the more so a breakfast talk, was with what they called a captatio benevolentiae, in English, a capturing of goodwill. I'll try that on you. I'll try to snaffle your benevolence by claiming that we are likely to have this in common, a great respect for tradition. Tradition is a broad term. I think we commonly understand by a tradition a practice we repeat say every week or every year, just because we've done that often. Part of its meaning comes precisely from its age, which makes it venerable, worthy of reference. For example, just two weeks ago, I was in the American city so wonderfully called Athens in Georgia to lecture at the university there. The professor who had invited me was an Orthodox Jew, and he asked me to dinner at his house. It was a Friday, Erev Shabbat in Hebrew, Sabbath evening. And though I was brought up in an assimilated household without Jewish ritual, this celebration of the seventh day, when God finished his creation and saw that it was very good, was very familiar and poignant to me. But evidently, a good Jew can't stop himself from waxing witty, even in sacred matters. And so I learned something hilarious. It is evidently a matter of competition. What father of the house can say the Shabbat blessing, in, in Hebrew, the bracha, and other preliminary prayers at the fastest clip <laughs> in consideration of the hungry family that's drawing in delicious aromas from the kitchen. And so my, professori uh, and so my professional host outdid any auctioneer in addressing our Lord, <laughs> who was presumably also pressed for earthly time. It was purely wonderful. Because one, I too was hungry and tired, having passed an afternoon trying to deal with the clever questions of a bunch of terrific graduate students in philosophy. And because two, I've often observed that true reverence is full of puckish laughter. And here was corroboration from a genuine practitioner of Judaism. What I've been describing then 
is traditionist ritual, which gains a certain patina as copper grows green from mere age. There's nothing in our constitution that keeps damn fools from doing their thing. Just as, for example, in the book of ritual for Passover, the Haggadah, in which one of those stupidly smart kids we've all run into is allowed to sit at the Seder table and ask aggressively contemptuous questions. For my part, I don't think you ought to do everything that you have a constitutionally protected right or your family's forbearing permission to do. But there's no question about the right, as long as you're willing to put up with the retaliation in which the offended side is under the same constitution and type and is entitled to engage. I've referenced a recent event, the same that Ms. McNair uh, referenced a moment ago. In fact, my, I'd like to have my little talks to have footnotes. And I have a footnote that says that I have in mind a recent to-do brought on by a football player who refused to stand up for the national anthem to protest some social justice. Well, he's got a right to do it, but he's got to take what comes afterwards. In fact, they are easy pickings for rebellious spirits in the demonstration mode, these vulnerable disruptions. It is an urgent question how to protect, protect our shrinking public forms and rituals without becoming reactionary about them. By reactionary, I mean a mode that concentrates all feelings on defense with little left over for the positive love of old forms, whose age is often a part of their beauty. But I want to talk to you this morning of tradition in another sense, a sense that is the opposite of old. To be sure, the word tradition itself means that which is handed over or handed down. And so by this very meaning, tradition comes from the past. Now past too has two meanings. One, probably the more common sense, is passed away, bygone, finished, done with, as, we, as when we sometimes say it's history, meaning that an event has seen its moment and no longer counts. I'll tell you my favorite example of what ought to be passed in that sense. If somebody has done you a bad turn, he might ask you to forgive him. And you might give him what he's asked for because he said that he's sorry. Or you might even forgive him without his asking because you rightly think, don't believe, right, rightly I think, don't believe that it's in our human power to forgive that is to declare someone else's wrongdoing all right, to undo a bad deed. You can't reach into the past and tweak it by making what's packed away there unhappen. What's done cannot be undone, says the once intrepid evildoer, Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth, who goes mad through just that knowledge. And you probably know it from your own experience. You feel practically forever in debt to people who've forgiven you, and they feel it too. So your offense is alive in, in you both. On the other hand, there's forgetting. If you've suffered a wrong, forget it in due time. Not for the sake of the perpetrator, who can justifiably be left to dangle a while, but for your own sake, to nullify the whole sorry business. Forgetting, however, isn't really discretionary. You can try, but trying really hard is counterproductive. So even a suppressed fact will rise up unbidden from memory. But what is in your power is to suppress this feeling of having been wronged, to refocus reposition your awareness so that your sense of insult or victimhood is displaced because you're otherwise occupied. And behold, the incident is truly past where alone its presence matters, 
in yourself. Moreover, a forgotten wrong is a much truer blessing for the sorry perpetrator as well. He'll say ages after, I'm sorry for what I did. And you'll say, Jesus, I can't even recall what you did do. It might even induce a slight and well-deserved feeling of neglect on the part of the forgotten sinner. All this was set up, all this was to set me up for that meaning of tradition which has most rigorously nothing to do with being past. That is the tradition for us in America, the Western tradition. Most ours, because it has given us the two notions and their realization which we live by in much of our private and civic life. I'm speaking of mathematical science and of representative democracy, both of which are first set out in the philosophical books of which this tradition is partly composed. Add to this the texts, novels, and poetry, musical compositions, and works of visual art that have shaped our sensibility, our common taste. This tradition, the elements of which used to be taught in public school, and the masterworks of which made up the college curriculum, has only a circumstantial relation to the past. Its works were largely made there, but they themselves are in no way history, in no way bygone, in no way passed away. Perhaps in no way is overstating it. I should say in no essential way. For some of these texts employ languages no longer spoken and notations no longer in use and examples, examples no longer familiar. They used to be a minor part of our education to, to catch up on that left behind information is what we learned in school. The books themselves, however, mostly don't even pretend to contain primarily information, but rather they contain thinking and imagining. And since little in them is intended to be di data for us, nothing essential in there is dated. The best I can do so early in the day is to give the example that imagine is most familiar and closest to many to you, the book of books, the Bible, as you probably know from the Greek work for Biblos, book, the book. This book comes in two parts, the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament and the Christian Bible or New Testament. The Hebrew Bible, my book, which, with which in all candor I'm woefully ill acquainted, gives an account it's not clear what its origin is, of the coming into being by creation of our universe and of the story of a people, the Hebrews, who think of themselves as chosen by their divinity to carry on his business on earth, which they do very defectively in the short run and quite undeflectedly in the long run. It also contains the basic imperatives, namely 10 of our ethical lives, and the numerous rules, namely 500 plus, of their daily observance. The second part of this dual book contains the personal accounts of witnesses to a new beginning, in which God, in ways its interpreters think is foreshadowed in the Old Testament, empties himself of his divinity to take on human form and a new law is instituted around his incarnation. Post-biblically, the Hebrews are dispersed out of the land they occupy in the Bible until the nation is reconstituted in Israel in the last century. The Christians as a community of faith spread over the West but face the threat of decline in recent times. Now, while the two communities, Jews and Christians, that live by these Bibles, are 
for all the dangers that dog them, still vitally alive, the books themselves seem vulnerable to aging, to being passé. Some Israelis I know think of the older Bible as simply a history book, venerable but subject to revision by archaeological research. Some American students I've had in class have never read either testament at all because faith was to their enlightened parents an antiquated mode and its laws for living seem to be an antiquated imposition. To me, these attitudes seem nonsensical. Neither failure of faith or of ethical adequacy is relevant to the reading, the keeping alive of this first book of one of the two parts of our traditions. When I say two parts, I mean this, that the second part of the Western tradition is Greek. Jerusalem and Athens together are our ancestral cities our spiritual hometowns. If you ask me to breakfast again, I'll talk about our Greek origin, to which I'm actually closer. Here is what I think counts. First, an unsquashable sense of the craggy grandeur of volume one and of the stupendous novelty of volume two of our book, a sense that can come to be sure only to those who've been made by their elders or their own curiosity to open it. But second, and far more to the point, is the objective content that arouses such veneration. Is there anything in the stories, songs, sayings, teaching, and revelations that does not move to thought a human being who is all there I mean one who doesn't live in the infinitesimally brief now, but whose soul is extended forward into expectation and backward into memory. Take Genesis, whoever its author. Our personal memory does not reach to the universal beginning, the genesis of our world, but our imagination surely does. And then arises the question, an unavoidable question to an untruncated human being, is that beginning self-constituting from a few elements and a few rules of combination? Or is it from the first, the institution of an intelligent design? Which one is more compatible with thinking? Which more in accord with evidence? Or take the end, John's revelation, which is a wild prophecy of the way our world will end. What third thoughtful person is not now and then overcome by the question how it will end or whether it will end? And if the end comes, whether it will come with a bang or a whimper, a bang being a nuclear explosion first strike and retaliation, and a whimper being the final taking down of the internet by cyber terror, be it by a government or a lone wolf. Will Armageddon, if it happens, happen literally at Megiddo in Israel, as it does in the Bible? Or possibly we have a chance to muddle through and go on, and John's vision will prove to be a fantasy. So present faith is not necessary to declaring the Bible as unaffected by time, nor is practical applicability to current conditions needed. For what comes first is non-practical thinking out of should and shouldn't, quite aside from could and couldn't. For example, I start to read Leviticus. I can't pretend to get through it. But I take in enough to see that to live by it as an American is to draw large drafts on my account of others' tolerance, to cut myself off from most of my contemporaries, which was, I'm told, the actual intention of this rule-enclosed way of life. But all that 
It's got nothing to do with the actuality of this priestly book. We can live in this land of the free without wondering whether life, without the constraint, who, I'm sorry, who can live in this land of the free without wondering whether life without the constraints of obedience, obedience not to a person but to the law from on high, does not make us miserably shapeless. And where we should look for our rules, at what level or realm they should operate, and how much self-forgiving transgression is permissible. So let me sum up what I'm trying to say. The Bible is not passé, not of the past, in the sense of bygone, insofar as faith may be failing, because its depth are thought-inducing for the faithful as well as the faithless. Perhaps they ought to be even more so for the latter. And similarly, the Bible is not out of fashion, insofar as its prescriptions may be inapplicable, inapplicable to contemporary life, because it is the very lesson book for thinking about what it means to duck out from under obedience to divinity and to be driven only by the necessities of the world. The Bible is just the best example for my claim. None of the works of the tradition are to be considered old, except insofar as in human works, not so much in human beings, old age often brings beauty. These works are hardly ever doctrinal catechisms or operational manuals, but something in between, places where incitements to ever active questions and treasures of attempted answers are recorded. And here I end. I think I may have been preaching to the choir, but I don't think I need to apologize. Since I agreed to make a speech, it was my duty to say something I believe in. And since I knew I was going to be addressing friends, I, knew, I also knew that you might have had such thoughts before I came along. Well, so much the better. As Socrates says in his prayer at the end of Plato's grandest dialogue, friends have things in common. Thank you.